This is BRS TV Answers. If you're planning your flow, want to do it better, or just want to know what good looks like, these are the questions that today's reefers are asking and the answers starting with number one. The starting point is by answering the question, what does good look like? And it's all about a third for the coral, third for the fish, and third for your filtration. Starting with the coral, the third for the coral, it's all about, uh, it's the circulatory system, I guess. If, you're, if your heart's pumping blood through your veins, the flow is pumping you know, wastes and byproducts from photosynthesis out of the corals and bringing in nutrients and nutrition into them as well. Yeah, basically every single thing that the coral gets is from the water uh, and everything that it needs to get rid of is also going into the water and you got to get past the boundary layer on the surface uh, of the coral that is going to require uh, enough turbulence uh, uh, enough forcefulness of the flow to get past that boundary layer and allow you know nutrients and elements to pass through the tissue of the coral as well as all of those oxidants and toxic byproducts of photosynthesis to get back out so it's really really important to this circulatory system the flow and it's different the most important part of this is it's not one size fits all it's different for all the different coral types and that's one of the things you're going to hear today mm. is how do you perfect this for all three of the major coral types you're gonna hear that a little later but the next thing one third for the filtration yeah. as well. Yeah, so you know we always talk about you know don't let dead spots happen in your tank, and you can see dead spots because that's where all the fish poo and all of the uneaten food starts to collect in the tank. So the flow portion is helping your filtration, which actually makes for more stable and better water conditions by getting that stuff up and suspended, getting rid of those dead spots where all of that collects, and then getting it out into your overflow and down into the filtration. You know the more more nastiness uh, you got going in your filtration, the more effective your filtration is. That looks like two different things often. Often like just consistent turbulent flow, keeping all of it suspended, going mm. down the overflow, or with tanks that don't tolerate that, it looks like uh, periodic bursts, like mm. those nutrient uh, export yeah, methods, yeah. where uh, it just bursts a big flow that you know the corals get waved around a little bit, but we also get all the stuff off the bottom and down where all the filtration is to pull it out. Now there is one more, one third for the fish. <laughs> yeah, flow is good for the fish too in uh, in a couple different ways. One, it's like a treadmill for your fish. They you know they need something to fight against and work those muscles and you know building those protein or using those proteins and aminos to build their muscles. They can actually work those muscles by swimming against the currents and using those different currents. Uh, also for the oxygen exchange and keeping you know, the water oxygenated, getting rid of that CO2 in the water. Uh, and also again for you know that filtration piece is part of the fish health as well too and the sleeping in your own waste or you know build up of those uh, nitrates, phosphates, potentially ammonias that uh, could happen with decaying matter in the tank. You know that filtration uh, also benefits the fish. Yeah, I mean, the fish do find little nooks and crannies to sleep in, and uh, over the years, they just get more and more polluted unless you're able to use flow to keep all that stuff suspended and out of the tank. Uh, it's also true, man, like having the fish, they're swimming against currents <laughs> in the ocean. It's healthy for them to be able to essentially exercise and the gas exchange. Mm. So really all three things, man. Flow is important to the corals. It's uh, important to all of your filtration and keeping the tank clean and also good for the fish. All right, question number two, why is gallon per hour or GPH like the worst way to <laughs> shop? And I know that we all do it. Mm -hmm. You're looking for 10X flow, 100X flow, whatever it might be. But you know, looking at a pump and seeing 2,500 gallons an hour, I'm gonna tell you, is just meaningless. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, this is a product of the only information the manufacturers provide for us is this arbitrary gallon per hour rating, and it's really difficult to measure, and uh, you know, it could be different, to the, the measurement approach could be different from one manufacturer to another, so who knows, you know, what the, you know, gallon per hour wise, and what does that mean for my tank? Uh, instead, we should be thinking about, uh, you know, what is 4,000 gallons in a beam different from 4,000 gallons in a wide angle, and how should I use that for my tank? Uh, gallons per hour, doesn't really matter at that point. You, know, you think about it like a sprinkler hose, you know, mm. if you widen it out and it goes over, you know, 80 degrees, mm. well, it just kind of trickles out and just barely sprays. <laughs> you put your hand in front of it, barely notice. But if you crank it down to that like little quarter inch mm. hole, man, the thing shoots 60 feet. And if you put your hand right in front of it, it's just 
pounding it, right? <laughs> so the 2,500 gallons an hour, like can really mean so many different things. It could be a gentle, slow flow, or it can be a laser beam that hits the other side of the tank. I noticed this personally, uh, we're using inductors in my own mm -hmm. tank, where I have a, a three quarter inch bulkhead in there, Put your hand in front of it, thousand gallons an hour, you barely touch it. You know, you can barely even feel any water coming out of it. However, if I screw on an adductor with a little quarter inch hole, man, it's just pounding it. You can see it in the tank, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. The adductor is obviously adding some in there, but interestingly enough, I have a flow meter in there and you can actually see the flow drop by half as you force it through that small hole. But man, what a difference in the tank. So gallons per hour, totally like i'm gonna go all the way to almost irrelevant if you don't understand what you're getting and by the end of the day man you will understand what you're getting because it's all about using the right tool for the right job and understanding what 2500 gallons an hour really does in the flow pattern that you're getting number three really important question is where are the areas of the lowest flow in the tank and you know you can see in the rock work some of these dead spots. You can see behind the rock work some of these dead spots in between rocks and corals and things like that. But you'd be surprised when you uh, look at how the pump actually flows that one of the massive dead spots is directly underneath the flow. It's where you know the, the water's pushing this way and it's just maybe kind of coming back this way. Uh, you look at it, just a big giant dead spot. But in order to solve for those uh, flow problems in the dead spots, you have to know where they are. Yeah, so we actually have done it with uh, little green beads and uh, some tracing dye in some cases as well. But uh, you can actually see when the water's shooting across, it eventually has to come back but it kind of does it like in a triangle where it finds its way back up to the pump, but right underneath the pump mm. is almost totally dead spot. It just kind of drags a little bit of water with it as it's going back up. So shockingly, the closest to the pump is sometimes <laughs> the, the lowest flow areas, but also, you know, when you look at your aquascape, you can almost just tell, like I got two pieces of my aquascape, well, right in between it, that's where the dead spot is. And if you look at it and say, I wonder why those corals aren't growing as well down there or why I've had corals die there, there's your reason. Uh, is yeah. they're not getting enough nutrients, they're not getting enough elements, they're not getting rid of those byproducts of photosynthesis. And also, the one solution doesn't always work for the forever and mm -hmm. why a flow evolves over time. So when we said earlier, maybe you're looking to up your game. Well, that's because when I started this whole thing, I had little one inch frags. Well, now they're big old colonies and it turns out that area in the, in the middle is just totally stagnant. Like there's almost <laughs> no flow at all. If I, you know, watch where the little detritus flakes in the tank go, or if, you know, I blow some bubbles in there, you can kind of mm -hmm. watch where they go. And you can see that the coral itself is blocking the flow. And if I added one more pump right in there, the tank would do so much better. All right, number four, does angle even matter? And uh, I don't know how you could come to any conclusion other than yes, yeah. uh, because really there are pumps out there like the Tune 6095, I believe mm -hmm. it was, yep. that has like a really, really 65 wide, degrees. A 65 yeah. degrees coming out of this thing. I mean, within a matter of, you know, 12 or so inches, it's already hit the top of the bottom. And then there's others that are shooting the same amount of water, but it's going a laser beam right across to, and not hitting the top at all. It goes all the way to the top before it kind of returns back around. Yeah. Then you got the gyre, which is like a 15 in degree, and it's super flat, like a little laser beam or sheet of water. You know, totally different things, yeah. totally different purposes. Yeah, they all have their own, and they, like we're going to get to later, they all of those angles have a use, and the biggest part is just figuring out what pump has what angle. And it's really hard to do by by eye. And like I said uh, earlier, the manufacturers aren't really putting this type of information out there. Uh, we've done some investigative testing, but once you start to see, oh, like that pump has 65 degrees and it only goes in a four foot tank, 12 inches, I, I now have an idea of where I'm gonna use this and it's not in my high velocity, high, high chaotic flow current SPS tank. I mean, I almost wish they would just label because you do see on some of the packaging, mm -hmm. you do see the angle of the output. I think Tunes has a couple of them, mm -hmm. like one of them says even wide, but it doesn't like actually tell you what you'd use it for. Yeah, exactly. It'd almost be better if it said instead of wide, it said LPS pump, you know, <laughs> and if it said narrow, it said, you know, strong, turbulent SPS pump. Yep. Uh, you know, if it told you a little bit of what, what it's designed for, but angle absolutely matters because one of them is going to provide soft, gentle, lots of flow, but over a wide area. And the other one is going to create a ton of turbulence and hit all the way to the other side. Closely related to that question number five, does velocity matter? Velocity not meaning gallons per hour. This is how fast 
that narrow or wide angle uh, type of pump is coming across. We're actually in the middle of testing velocity on top of angle testing for a variety of different pumps. But as you leave the pump tip and you move, you know, sections at a time, you can actually start to get an idea of, you know, how fast is this narrow beam compared to another narrow beam? Maybe one a one inch narrow beam versus, you know, this 15 degree or uh, 15 degree beam, you know, those two different things at different at same gallons per hour could be different velocities in different sections of the tank. So where this really comes together is I could have two 2,500 gallon an hour pumps. Mm -hmm. And if I put our velocity meter right in front of the nozzle of both of them, they might actually read almost the same number. But if I move it out a foot and a half, well, the beam is still gonna be reason, it's just laser fast water. But the one that has a wide angle is gonna be reading almost nothing. Yep. But the inverse is true as well, is if I take that velocity meter and I move it up out mm. of the laser, well now, the uh, pump that performs so well with that beam is moving almost nothing up here, but the wide angle is actually moving water. So when we understand you know, how these two things come together, the velocity as well as the angle, we can start selecting the right tools for the right job. Number six, this was hotly debated when I entered the hobby, but nobody debates this anymore. Does random flow matter? And mm -hmm. the answer is absolutely yes. If you just turn on two opposing pumps and leave them on, corals are gonna get blasted the exact same way all day, every day. The point of turbulence will always be in the dead center of the tank. Uh, and that just isn't good for the corals. And you'll see it not only in mortalities, but you also see it in like funky grow <laughs> patterns as they're just constantly getting blown one direction or another. So that doesn't mean that I need to have chaotic flow where it's changing every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen it done well where this one's on for an hour, that one's on for an hour, they're both on for an hour, and then just kind of rotates back and forth. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know, the most advanced solution, but yeah, like random, not really the word, varied flow, there you go. definitely important. Question number seven, does turbulence matter? Turbulence different than any of the other ones that we talked about and different than current in that turbulence is exactly where those pumps smash together. So 4,000 gallons coming this way, 4,000 gallons coming this way. If you kept them on at 100% constant, they'd smash in the middle, but it's a really chaotic turbulent zone right there. The key that we've learned and we uh, did on the 160 is moving that turbulence point. So if this pump is on 10% and this is on 90, my turbulence points way on one side of the tank and then I can gradually shift that back and forth so all the corals are getting you know a very different chaotic turbulence point from periods uh, throughout the day. Yeah, it's really the point at where two pumps together are creating a stronger thing than they would do by themselves. I think about it like a magnet. You mm. know, if you had two magnets, uh, 50 pound magnets uh, far apart from each other, they're 50 pound magnets. But you put them close to each other and bam, man, they're really, really <laughs> strong. Uh, that's 100 pounds, uh, you know, hitting each other. That's what that point of turbulence is doing, is creating stronger, chaotic flow that's just flushing everything out uh, around uh, the corals, off of the rock, out of the sand and shifting back and forth that turbulence specifically great in SBS tanks that tend to tolerate it and also really require a lot a lot of flow to be able to handle all that excess photosynthesis that's coming from the really high powered lights. Number eight one more definition here does current matter? Yeah, so current is something totally different, meaning that I'm making a strong, sustained cycle of a flow that's pretty repetitive. Think your gyres, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Gyres shooting, you know, 4,500 gallons an hour across the top, and it all returns and creates a you know circulatory event. Okay, it's totally, totally different. Does a couple of things well. Often it will help get a lot of the detritus off of the sand, you know, just like get it suspended and carry it away. But also really great for corals that appreciate high flow, but don't really tolerate turbulence very well. So like euphilia doesn't really tolerate, you know, Smashing turbulence. Smashing water, yeah. yeah. But it does tolerate uh, uh, currents really well as it shifts back and forth. So, you know, things like the gyres, things like, you can really use any pump that's like just one of them's on for a sustained period of time. You can create that current in the water that's totally, totally different than turbulence and often good for corals that don't tolerate turbulence like your softies, like uh, many LPS, like your gonies, like uh, your euphilia. 
Number nine, we're talking about aimability next. And does that matter? And yes, it does, especially when you're trying to get the perfect flow solution or perfecting your for your corals, your fish, and your filtration. You know, if I have a power head that can uh, only point one way and that's the way it's gonna go for the rest of the time it's in my tank, I'm you know creating these dead spots and not taking care of them, in which case I need a pump option that will be allow me to target it. And a lot of times it comes in this type of form here, almost 360 degrees of, mo of range of turning this pump. If I have a dead spot in the back of my uh, aquascape or in the middle of my aquascape, I can now put a pump in the smart spot, point it in any direction to kick that dead spot up. And now I've perfected the flow in that area. Yeah, you know, it comes down to that angle thing again. Like, so if I'm shooting a laser beam out of here, I'm shooting a little laser beam whatever direction it wants to go. And you can kind of see it on some pumps where there's like a cone on the end mm -hmm. and then the propeller is pretty deep set back. You can kind of expect that in many cases to shoot, you know, pretty narrow beam out. Uh, but uh, they're also like those in 1695s where they're really wide and they're clearly stated. If I just aim this down just a little bit, that wide angle is actually gonna hit almost the bottom of the sand parallel to mm -hmm. the uh, glass. And I can actually get it down where I just said it's really hard to get it. Yeah. Uh, so think about where you want it and then use that tool again. And we keep saying right tool, right job because we treat flow pumps like it's you know a branding exercise or like it's a yeah. 250 or 2500 gallon an hour exercise it's about getting flow where i need it and so there's not just the aimability of uh, something like obviously the tunes you can aim anywhere you want but there's other like smaller flow things like you may not need that degree and these tiny little cheches go where you want them to go as well and i just popped that one out but you can also use things like totally different solutions like the max Spec. Turn it on the, its side. You can turn it on its side. I can shoot a laser beam of a sheet of water across the back, right behind yeah. it. It won't uh, actually hit the rock or the corals for the most part. I got this on my own 360. I'm shooting down the sides of the glass. Uh, you can shoot water across the top uh, of the coral. So aimability is super and super important if you want to dictate where the flow goes. Number 10, does a battery backup matter? And honestly, this is probably one of the most important things that you'll hear today. We say it all the time, we're gonna say it again. One pump on the tank, man, should have a battery backup. I don't care what it is. The mm -hmm. AC power bob blocks for your computers will add in a ha handful of hours. Something like this right here will last you up to 80 hours, multiple days. But there should be one pump on your tank that automatically turns on when the power goes out because it's inevitable. Almost everyone is going to run into a power outage, as many people once a year, if not uh, you know, every couple of years. So you know, if you don't plan for this, it's gonna happen to you and you're going to regret it. So uh, there are lots of different options out there now. Tunes has an option where you can just go buy a battery off mm -hmm. the shelf and use their, uh, what they call it, safety, safety connector. connector. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Vortex probably the most well known for their solution because they were first to market, I believe with mm -hmm. it, or near the first, might have been a tie with Tunes. A couple other ones out there, but make sure that one of the pumps has this. You don't have to have all of them, by the way, just because you have four Vortex in your tank doesn't mean you have to have four <laughs> battery backups. No. It's really just one plugged in because we just need to keep that gas exchange going, happening in the tank during the power outage. You'll be happy you did it. Number 11 is where all of these come together and choosing the right tool for the right job, starting with SPS and SPS characteristic type corals. You know, these are you know, come back to that high velocity, high turbulent flow, that ever changing point of turbulence to, you know, especially in the middle of the day when the photosynthesis is happening you know, a lot higher rate than the rest of the day. These SPS corals need to increase the flow. These two are mutually exclusive par and, and flow and increasing them. So, you know, a reef crest mode, like from uh, the Vortec pumps, you have multiple pumps changing their flow rates multiple times throughout the day, but randomly and chaotically uh, helps to create those uh, changing points of turbulence and high velocity. So why do SPS corals need more flow? It's all related to lighting. In fact, uh, Worldwide said it best that uh, flow is actually more important in lighting. And this is why. When we raise up the PAR levels, uh, you know, if we're shifting from 100 PAR to 350 PAR, the rate of photosynthesis is happening inside of that coral is likely triple or more. Uh, and it needs to get rid of all of these oxidants. And it's believed that the ability to get rid of those oxidants is closely related to bleaching. 
if it can't get rid of all those oxidants from all that photosynthesis happening and flow being the main mechanism that it's going to rid itself of that, the only thing it can do to not die is expel all of its zooxanthellae into the water mm. in a desperate attempt to stay alive. So flow is what's gonna stop that from happening. So in addition to that, when we talk to Worldwide, and remember these are people that do this for a living. Success means whether they go out of business or not. <laughs> uh, and also whether or not they're getting you guys healthy corals is the fact that it isn't about two opposing 2,500 gallon an hour pumps. You know, you'll see that you know Vortex probably the number one SPS nut uh, pump. You know, you put two on the sides. That is the basis for that shifting turbulent flow because these aren't really narrow and they're not really wide. They're kind of in the middle of the road and shifting that turbulence. But you'll definitely see it cross a four foot tank for mm -hmm. sure. But then there's still dead spots in the tank if you go looking for them, especially in established tanks where those corals have gotten bigger. Then you start using different pumps to solve unique different problems throughout the tank as a holistic solution. So not about 100x, it's about getting the flow where it needs to go. And pretty much visually, you can spot where those dead spots are and solve. All right, number 12, what's best for LPS corals and is totally different. Now this is wide, gentled, varied flow, shifting around, but still not just blasting these corals. And this one is probably the easiest to see because frankly, they will show it to you. <laughs> uh, in an event that they're healthy and they found the right amount of flow, they're all, they'll look lush, they're not getting pounded, they're not retracted. They're also not so little flow that they're like stretching out. Mm -hmm. You can just kind of spot where that health uh, or sweet spot of health is. And remember that these corals, you know, they're lower par corals, which inherently means most of the time they're found deeper. Mm -hmm. You're not seeing chaotic, like weather driven, uh, uh, you know, currents and, uh, or weather driven turbulence in the water. It's often deeper, which means it's more current driven, just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, like stable flow patterns that shift throughout the day. So I think of, uh, you know, Vortec is doing a lot of some of the like more thought leading flow patterns. And so the uh, tidal swell mode on this one, which is, you know, this one's up for a, while, uh, are a little stronger and this one's low. And then they kind of slowly change as they pass each other, uh, shifting from left to right. And occasionally both being on strong, which flushes all of uh, the detritus and waste out of the tank you know, a little bit more flow than the coral might like for that short period of time, but then shifting back to the gentle flow. So, you know, thinking about LPS corals, think about how I can get varied flow throughout the tank, but a lot of it and still looking for the dead spots and solving. Number 13 brings us to the soft corals, softies like zoas and polys and toadstools and leathers and all these different types of corals. These less flow, more gentle flow than uh, LPS. Uh, they don't have a skeletal structure like your LPS uh, torches have these skeletal branches, really holds them into the position or into the place that they are. Softies, not as much, uh, but the wider, more gentle, and a period of uh, turbulent flow again for kicking up the detritus. Uh, one of the uh, you know nutrient transport mo or transport mode comes to mind when talking about the MP uh, the MPs and the vortex. You now this thing is a nice gentle flow, and then every once in a while it'll just surge up, get everything uh, too suspended and out to the filtration. Now, there's a lot of low, wide, gentle flow pumps. The tunes is 6095s work really well in this, and even indirect flow from things like you know your um, your gyres and different things. Currents, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say in most <laughs> cases with uh, your softy tanks, the wider, yeah. the better, mm. right? Uh, also though, those wave boxes or wave modes that you can create oh, with yeah. a lot of different pumps, so, you know, where the water kind of just sways back and forth. Uh, those things, getting flow, surrounding the whole coral, but you know, a big giant, you know, leather or cingularia mm -hmm. or a toadstool, like just doesn't really appreciate being pounded. You know, your anemones, your RBTAs, uh, even mushrooms growing on the coral, like don't really want to be pounded. They'll mm. let go and then they'll probably get shredded. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, think about with those things, wider the better in most cases, but it doesn't mean less flow. It means that you're hitting that flow over a wider area, thinking about that you know, garden hose, it's turned out to spray as wide as can, but still doing the same amount of flow, just not as forceful. 
All right, number 14, what is the best low profile? I gotta be honest, this is the, probably the most important thing of the whole thing for me because the whole reason I got the tank is so it looks nice. <laughs> uh, and there's a bunch of different options. Some of them are pretty obvious. Obviously the uh, Vortec is uh, one of the best options because you don't have the cord in the tank. You definitely have a pump uh, motor on the outside, but everything pretty much has something on the outside, be a, a big magnet right. brick or something like that. In the end, uh, if I had to pick cord on the inside of the tank or the outside the tank, it will always be on the outside. Well, and this is one of the best ones that hides on like the back of the tank. So mm -hmm. you know, I don't have to you know, uh, get rid of one of my side view panes if I can put the pump on the back. Now you're gonna probably have to have your, your tank away from the wall a little bit to achieve that, but it disappears in the black background. All right, so we're probably a feature of the choir here because yep. everybody can see how easy and simple it is. But when this doesn't work, uh, I mean, I actually mentioned that yep. I, on my own tank, I have these on the back for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Because once it's on the back, you don't have a cord, you don't have a motor, you just have these things on the inside, you'll never even see anything. Yeah. But also, there's other options out there uh, like the gyre here. So the big part of this is there's two pieces to it. It's the pump and the cord. Now the pump, often looks like uh, refined, like they made it to look nice. To, and it's, you know, put it on the glass wall. But when you have this like dangly, uncontrolled cord, it always <laughs> looks terrible. One of the reasons that the gyres look really nice is because you can put these things really, really high, like right up almost on the water level and not have it create vortex in the water. And then the cord is invisible because it comes out the top of the pump. Right, so and you can even do it on the back of the pump because the cord, you can put mm -hmm. this almost within an inch of the top and the cord travels up the length of the body as well. So almost no cord at all, but there's other options too, just due to the small form factor. Yeah, the uh, Nero 5 for one, these Nero pumps, very small in the tank as far as footprint. There's quite a few some low profile footprint ones. These CHA uh, Extremes, uh, very small, but one of the, some of the smaller footprints that has uh, some decent amount of flow. But it, you know, in the end, it's all about, it has to look nice. Does cords matter to you? Does blocking your viewing pane on a peninsula tank matter to you? Does not blocking one of your side viewing panes matter to you? In which case there's options that are low profile to meet all of those needs. The whole purpose of this thing is to look beautiful and cords just mess it up. Number 15, you've honed your selections down to the right tool for the right job, but there is the point of maintenance and how easy or how much effort is this gonna take for me to maintain these types of pumps? Now, maybe you can achieve the same flow results with a lower maintenance pump and that's kind of the uh, the winner there in, you know, in your choice, in your decision. I can tell you one of the easiest, and we've said it hundreds and hundreds of times, one of the easiest to maintain are these Vortec pumps where I just have a clean side and I have a dirty side. I walk by, I swap it out, maintenance done. I go soak the other one. Uh, there's some other ones that, uh, you know, if, if it has a long cord, it might be easier to maintain because then I don't have to remove it all the way from my tank. I just bring a bucket of citric acid over. Or maybe uh, my cord isn't like an AC style where it has a disconnection point from the head unit and I can just pull the whole, you know, the whole pump out. These are, you know, considerations when it comes to maintaining it down the road. Uh, that you should be aware of specifically when we're talking like some of these pumps you have to completely disassemble almost every month. Yeah, there's a frequency element too. Mm -hmm. So not only how difficult is it to, to clean, but uh, in my experience, the gyres really should be cleaned uh, every 30 to 60 days, yep. right? Yep. And not everybody wants to do that. This has a lot of different parts in it. Some of them uh, can be broken when you're taking it apart. Uh, you know, like there isn't a whole lot of parts to this one. Uh, but uh, again, man, like this is, probably the number one reason why I, I guess it's, it's a, between the aesthetics and, and the ease of use, yeah. but yeah, you just pull it out, swap a new one in, soak it for next time. Uh, but there are ways that you can organize this regardless of whatever pump you use that makes it a lot easier. Probably the best way is to make sure that you have a little bit of slack on the pump so that you can bring that bucket of citric acid and then just drop the pump right in there and let it run in the citric acid next to the tank for an hour or so. You know, rinse it off really well and put it back in the tank. You may not even need to disassemble the whole thing in that case, but you do need to leave yourself enough slack. One of the other things that uh, is beneficial is if you have ability to disconnect it from the power source. Mm -hmm. So. You know, if I had my typical AC power head from Tunes, chase that cord. I gotta find the whole <laughs> cord all the way down to the outlet, and I probably did some kind of cord management, or if I didn't, it looks like a disaster, and I'm gonna have to fish it all out. It's probably a rat's nest. 
and then clean it and then fish it all the way back down and make it, I'm never gonna do it. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, if though, like with the DC tunes pumps, the controller actually disconnects from the power, I can grab the pump, I can grab the controller, I can bring it to the sink, uh, just soak it in the citric acid, call it a day. Mm -hmm. So think about how you're doing this. Don't lock down all the power heads in a way that you can never get it out, because if you do that, you'll never get it out. Uh, and think about the frequency piece of it, because like literally if, if you say, cleaning a pump every two months is not for me, well, the gyre may not be the best solution for you. However, it's such a unique flow pattern. If it's the right tool for the right job, Maybe you want to make the leap. All right, so the question we didn't answer today is how would you possibly know which of these pumps are wide, which ones are narrow, which ones are going to make four feet, which ones are going to hit the top and the bottom of the tank inside of 12 inches? Well, <laughs> the answer is Randy did the investigates for you just the other day. You can find it all here. I'm going to tell you there are two that outperform all the others.